So this is our kind of our new catchphrase. We've been we've been in business for 10 years and we're always trying to sort ourselves out into being something that does be work better than we had before. And part of that is being kind of elegant in your phrasing, meaning don't use another word than you have to. Uh, and really what we do is we, are, we partner with folks uh, to help prepare them to create their better future, not our better future, but their, their, their better future. Um, and as I said, this is our 10th anniversary. Um, this is our kind of our broad statement right now. It's not really a mission or vision statement, but it probably will be. Uh, we were, it's, uh, we're a water-centered nonprofit organization established in 2010 based in the U.S. We partner with the vulnerable and underserved communities around the world to produce sustainable billiard scale technologies designed to fulfill basic human needs. Our shared investment creates health and social benefits that prepare people to create their better future. Um, what I'd like to do now is give a very quick overview of the steps that we use and some examples of those steps, um, maybe spending five or six minutes on that, and then get to an actionable project that um, I would ask you to uh, consider being involved in. And um, so, and then as many questions as you want, and if you need to ask me a question during the middle of something, just, uh, just holler. Um, so we have a five-step process when we work with a com community, and I'll get to more about why we do all that in a minute. Um, but the first step is um, a survey. And we go into a community and we start getting these filled out. And it's a community profile. We ask about men, women, children, number of schools, health clinics, what kind of community leadership you have. Um, a lot of these things you'll see are not fill, filled out. Um, find out about business and employment. Then we ask about the actual water situation, uh, wash, which is water, sanitation, and uh, hygiene. Um, spend a little bit of time on that. Um, education, classroom, so what kind of uh, stuff they have for their, their uh, children. And, and that's it. And what we end up doing here, you might see, um, this just keeps going. It's uh, 372 pages of uh, surveys given to us by one com community. Um, and that's fantastic. Uh, the next step is uh, something called a community engagement process. And that is where we, uh, and this is Matsaka, we go and visit the community. We use a two uh, method process uh, of talking to people who, whose, whose towns we are essentially invading. Um, and uh, and those, those, those two steps are asset-based uh, community development, which is not it, as opposed to needs-based community development. We assume that everybody has gifts that they can bring to the table. And rather than looking upon what their situation is as a problem or a need, we look upon it as a challenge that can be solved together. Um, and so we do that as through asset-based community development. And we also use something called appreciative inquiry, uh, which is focusing on the positives. We do not we do not discuss negatives as needs. We discuss negatives as challenges, once again, that we will be solving together. Um, this process usually takes three, three days. Uh, the first day we get as many people from the village together as possible. And uh, I think in Matsaha, we probably had 80 or 90 people, uh, with a 4D process, we call it. Uh, the first day is about people, their, their dreams, their desires, um, People talk about what they like to do. I like being a servant of God, says one person. Uh, unity is what I like to do. Dressmaking is what I like most. Um, so we just start hearing about people, and then we start hearing about things that they they have challenges with. Um, we've dug wells, um, but the, the wells break. Um, the nearby factory pollutes our only stream. Um, and we build on that. And then we come back the next day um, and we ask people what they can bring. 
to this con conversation? How can you make it make it better? And people say, um, I am a teacher. I am educated. Um, I am a housewife. Um, I am emotional. I thought that was a great one. Um, and um, but we get a list of all of their various all their various strengths, and through those we figure out what they actually want to achieve. Uh, and we put together a, a list. And then on the third day, and this actually happens every other day um, because we have to have a day spent de debriefing. Um, on the final day, we make assignments to the individuals and we cement the partnership. And, and we play a very equal role. We, this is not an asymmetrical relationship at, at at all, we partner with a community-based organization, and we we partner with a community-based NGO, and those are a little bit different. Um, but we all are equilateral, and we all make decisions together. And at the end, they put together a list of what they wanted us to to, to do in the order they wanted us to do it in. And they started off with with soap making, as Judy had mentioned. In the time of COVID, uh, suddenly this became very necessary. And Kenyan schools were just forced to reopen here about three weeks ago, and they didn't have any allotment for soap and hand washing statements uh, stations. So us being able to produce soap for them was exactly what they wanted. Us being responsive to them uh, is what we desire. Uh, so it all works out. Uh, so that's the that's the community engagement part of the. Uh, the process. Uh, we then jump to something called planning, and um, this actually is fairly lengthy process. It took us about a month and a half to do because we want to do it right. Um, and this is the Matsaha Multipurpose Soap Training Production and Sustainability Plan because what happens and you can see this anywhere you go in Africa, is you will see mile after mile after mile of uh, places where nonprofits used to be. Because it's a, it's a very standard situation that you fly in, you do a little bit of work where you just send money and then you leave. Uh, and without a, without a sophisticated, well-managed plan, uh, which is engagement, it's you know working with people. Uh, without having that, you don't really have anything. So we ended up going through this fairly involved sustainability plan, um, gives an introduction of why we're doing it, what the process is, the materials, who the trainer is, the training goal, the training content. Um, we actually get into the actual ingredient list because this all has to be approved by the government so that we can sell it to schools. Um, as it goes on, we how, how we're gonna produce it, where we're gonna store it, who does what, what Friendly Water for the World provides, what the Matsaka Development Group provides, um, what TCSC, which is another partner we have, what they, that they provide. We then go into a fairly detailed marketing and production plan. And, um, and on it goes. And this is something that if you read it, and I know that you can't because I'm scrolling very fast. Um, but if you were to read it, you would see that there's there's a lot of different voices in there because it was not written by me. It wasn't written by my staff. It was written by two groups out of Ke Kenya. Uh, and then we did some editing work on it uh, to make it all, all uh, cohesive. Uh, but this is their voices uh, talking about what their goals are and their desires and how they plan to achieve them. We are simply here to help them carry that, carry that out. Um, after the after we get a plan, we actually go into our, our, our training. Um, what Will probably talked about was some of the things that we do. Um, this is our biosand water filter. And these are the children at the school that we just delivered it to. Uh, this was a training done in um, Zambia. This is probably one of our, or this is our single most popular training right now, which is the brick making machine, interlocking soil stabilized bricks. Uh, these are non-fired bricks, so people do not have to burn down their forests in order to make kilns in order to fire bricks, um, which is fantastic uh, because you will, you will see these big mounds, these 
pyramidal mounds that have holes in the middle of them. And they actually go out and they take living trees, they cleave them, they shove them into the middle and you start a fire that burns for six, seven, eight days until everything is, is, is fired. The bricks are terrible, they fall apart, they crumble easily, they're irregular, uh, they're not easy to build with. You end up using some mortar that it's, it's, it's mind numbing. As somebody who used to be a builder, it's mind numbing to see how much mortar they use. These on the other hand, um, each brick is the exact same as the one before it. It's a fantastic way to build a building. You can go up to three stories with these, the, these bricks. Uh, but most interesting, this is a school um, that they it re requires 14,000 of our bricks. They made all 14,000 bricks um, and they built what they call a three by one school, which is three classrooms, one office. Um, fantastic stuff. Uh, this is our water catchment, which is actually being attached to one of the schools. Uh, we have two types of ways of doing this. One is ferro cement, which is what you see them doing here, which is plastering over a wire structure. And the other is now using curved bricks, uh, which makes it go up even faster. And you only need a thousand curved bricks and you can build a 20,000 liter, which is 5,000 gallon water tank. Um, this is our liquid soap process. Um, this is the production team in Matsaha. Um, we started their process about um, five weeks ago and they've already made 500 liters of soap. We just put in a new order uh, for new soap mixing materials in Nairobi and they'll be starting their second 500 liter batch. We keep a thousand liters of materials in reserve at all times. Um, so that's going well. Um, this is us in India uh, doing a, um, this is, you're sifting the gravel, which has to be two different sizes for the uh, biosand filters. And this process, if you're harvesting locally, which means it's going out and digging in the ground, uh, takes four or five days in order to get the materials necessary to build about 50 filters. Um, but this is a, village down in Tamil Nadu, down towards the southern part of India. And uh, this is one of our larger trainings that we did there. And uh, it's, a, it's a household technology. Um, so it is going to be primarily created by women in that area, uh, as men wouldn't have a role in producing something that is being used for the house. Um, so we have to be sensitive to that. Uh, as well wherever we're, we're going. Um, when we're done with our training, we then have a, a process called optimization, which is probably not the best word, but we can find another word that really describes it. And uh, what it means is that we actually hire somebody from the local organization to work on behalf of Friendly Water for the next four or five years. And they are our direct line of connection as far as uh, telemetry, reporting, um, sending media files, whatever we need um, so that we can be in constant contact with the community that we're working with. Not only that, we're also, we also have paid full-time staff that's only 30 miles away from uh, the community that I was just, ju just showing you. Um, so um, out of optimization, we do get a, uh, I'm trying to see if I have an example of it here of the, um, and I don't think I do, but of the monthly reportings that are, are sent in. And uh, it's just a nice way of, of, of maintaining this long-term contact that needs to be established in order to be successful in any community you, you go into. I think one of the, uh, Last things I would say about that is our, let me see if I can, this is, this is very interesting. This is our takeaways after 10 years of community development of all the mistakes that we, we made and we made plenty. Um, we, we, we realized some key things. Um, and the first is that our work starts and ends with community engagement. And this is 
probably not necessary to tell a rotary club. Um, but the, the fact that you have to have people constantly talking to people and connecting with people and maintaining a network and establishing the network and reinforcing the network and having frequent meetings in order to celebrate the network and to celebrate your accomplishments and to always be moving forward, that's, that's what you need to be effective. Um, this goes back to how we do our, our community engagement is that we have to acknowledge that the communities hold the key to their future, not us. Uh, we're simply there as a catalyst. We make things, uh, we help things along faster. Um, that said, it takes time and it takes place. And what we mean by place is you don't want to be bouncing from location to location. Um, you want to, you, you really want to establish a bulkhead um, and um, beachhead and, um, and uh, be there for a long time. We see ourselves being in any community from at least five to 10, ten years. Um, and this is a, uh, about the, the follow-up, the optimization, is that everything that happens after you deploy the technology is at least as important as the technology. And you know whether it's World Vision or, or Friendly Water or Water Charity or Water Aid or Scope or any one of the, the hundreds, if not thousands, of, of groups that do this work, the ones that do it right um, are the ones that stick around and, and, and make sure that any questions that are, are, are asked have an answer to them, any problems that are discovered are solved. Uh, and that the people, the people know that they have a partner. Our greatest asset is them and you and anybody else who partners with us. Um, it's just fundamental to making things, to making things work. Um, now, speaking about partners, the, let me just stop the share here for a moment. Speaking of partners, um, we are actually partnering with a Rotary Club out here from Seattle on a project. And this is University Rotary from the UW area, uh, University of Washington area of uh, Seattle. Um, they are in an area called, um, I'm gonna go back to the screen share, uh, in an area called Bukabero uh, in Uganda. Now, very quickly, this is Kenya. Um, so Lake Victoria here. Um, so if this is this is Kenya. Um, our headquarters is right here in a little village called Kambiri. And um, that's where our program manager lives. Now, we're currently doing a project right about here in a place called Matsaha, which is where you saw a lot of the pictures from. That was where the community engagement was. Um, and here's the downtown. This is Matsaha Shopping Center. So um, a lot of people think you're going to see a, a Sears and a JCPenney, um, but you're not. <laughs> And let me see if I can bring the screen up. So this is this is what downtown Masaha looks like, and this is the so this is the area that we're doing a lot of work in right right now. Um, and that's kind of what all the areas are going to look like. Um, but what we have undertaken with what, what we have yeah, undertaken with questions. the university club is a project here in Baduda, Uganda. Um, and somebody said they had a question. Yeah, how far away is Kisumu? Uh, Kisumu is pretty darn close. Um, It'll be right down here. We are involved in an educational project in Kisumu. Oh. Do they yeah, build so, schools? 
<laughs> no, to uh, well, it, it's to provide an educational uh, 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 system that would allow uh, existing high schools to uh, give a second chance to students who dropped out, and also to um, have a system where they are taking uh, uh, a portion, well, a significant portion of this uh, um, e-learning to help students who are applying to college exams uh, over over the internet. So, so we are very interested in, you know, kind of leveraging our presence there. <laughs> I see. Yeah. So do you Victor, do you think that Go ahead, Judy. the question is, are they close enough to monitor this project for us? Well, I, I, I don't know if they're close enough, but I'm wondering, uh, to, uh, a question to Kurt is, is there a Rotary Club that has done global grants that you are aware of in the uh, Kenya area that we could partner with? Because uh, I'm not sure whether the existing club we're partnering with has the manpower oh, to, uh, okay. to do uh, a significant water project. Yeah, let me, that's no, one of the reasons that I am looking at this spot in Uganda, uh, which as I said is in Baduda uh, and it's called Bukabero. And this is actually a volcanic crater uh, right next to Mount Elgon. <laughs> Uh, here, uh, which is an active or semi-active volcano. Uh, so we're talking about a location here. In Bali is the, is the Rotary Club that University District is partnered with um, and that will be getting our funding through for the initial stages of the project that's already underway. My thinking was, and I had talk to the university club about this and our contact there is uh, Sheila Hosner and she's the co-chair of the international committee um, that um, they want to get lined up for a global grant as well um, and in the discussions I've been having with uh, Rotary with yourselves and with another Rotary in Hamilton, New York, is there seems to be some movement to having three or four Rotaries involved with a single program as a means of uh, uh, yeah. providing coherent support, multiple layers of oversight, uh, and everybody gets a victory when the pro when the when the uh, program succeeds. So yeah, that's why I was. Sense. Yeah, I was just gonna say it makes sense to me if if they have already started and they're looking for partners rather than us reinventing the wheel, we should support them. Yeah, and I don't even know if it's so much as a as a you supporting them as as both of you supporting the Bucabero community. Oh, 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 um, oh right. But, but so they could be the head and, and we could contribute. Yeah, and once again, I don't think I don't know if there's any need for anybody to be in front of anything on this. I think all all partners, all equal, um, everybody doing this together um, just sounds like a great way to move move forward. And 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 also, it's a great way to test relationships. Um, the the Bucabero, the uh, Sheila. She is actually the director of the Bucabero Community Health Center, which largely exists in her head. Um, but her goal is to create an environment where they can build their, their health center in the next five or six years. And she's trying to raise $100,000 for that. Um, she sees using a brick machine now as maybe one of the mm -hmm. ways they can build this, this, this health center. And one of the ways they can provide water is by building water catchments. And I think she might very well be be right um but so she's an effort on her own and then that's combined with her rotary um they have come up with i believe let's see they are funding the, they funded our community survey in bucabero they funded the community engagement in bucabero and they funded the front end of the soap making um hmm. 
and the, the soap making is, let's see, soap making budget. Okay, so the soap making that we did there uh, in US dollars was uh, $1,500. $1, um, what we, we did not get funding for because they didn't, this is reserve money that they had or extra money that they had was when we do our soap making, we do subsidies attached to it. So the second batch, rather than saying we've done a training, you're on your own, best of luck. Um, the second batch, we provide 75% of the funding. The third batch, we provide 50%. The fourth batch, 25%. And the fifth batch, they're on their own. If they're not on their own, then we'll figure out a way to make to make it work. But we're already on the second batch, and they have their 25% ready. So going as mm -hmm. planned so far. Um, if this is something that your group is interested in, uh, these three subsidies total uh, about $1,400. Um, and this is in Bucabero. Um, also in Bucabero, though, is the brick making. Um, now, in my mind, let me just quickly show you this. Um, the project, uh, the training cost for that is 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 fifty six hundred dollars. Um, they already have thirty five hundred dollars, so they would be looking for two thousand one hundred dollars uh, between the. The brick making training and the soap making, it's $3,500. Um, but about these, about these bricks, uh, we have two types of bricks, uh, straight and curved. Um, the, the straight builds any building that you want. It does it without cutting down forests. Um, you, can, you can make the bricks on the site uh, meaning that you're not creating an embodied carbon footprint by driving bricks from one place to another. Um, they're easy to make. They can be made by local labor. Uh, we provide all the, the teaching for how you test the soils. Um, and already they're being used to build teachers' houses and, and schools. A thing to know is that you can build a school, but no teacher's going to come unless you build a teacher a house. So... Um, if the teacher doesn't have a house, no teacher. So you have to build a teacher's house with each, each school. Um, and the straight bricks do, do that. They, we, we, we've used them to, or people have used them to build clinics. Um, they've used them, uh, to build storage facilities and they built them to build a chicken coop, uh, which is something we didn't have on our list of things, but it happened. The curved brick on the other hand is, uh, the arc that each brick has, when laid out, it builds a 20,000 liter water catchment tank. Um, water catchment, in my opinion, is going to be the most important simple technology that the developing world uses in the next number of years, even more important than the biosand filter. Because as we're watching streams and rivers dry up because of inconsistent rain, not because of a lack of rain, but because it's, it's, incon it's inconsistent. It all comes down, you'll, you'll, you'll get four inches in an hour, um, and then you just have rivers that create washes, and all that rain is gone. Uh, it's not even in the uh, soil. Uh, between the deforestation from chopping down everything to burn to burn bricks and then drilling holes deeper and deeper into the ground, you end up bringing up arsenic and fluoride at levels that rot people's teeth out uh, and make their bones brittle with the fluoride and the arsenic. It, it changes your skin and then it might very well kill you. Um, compelling reason to start building water catchment tanks attached to schools, to clinics, to people's houses. Uh, 20,000 liters is roughly 5,000 gallons. Um, I think you're giving, uh, for 365 days a year, that's about 15 gallons a day um, available to a, a family. And it's, 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 a, it's a borehole well that doesn't have to be drilled. It's the, it's the watershed that it doesn't have to be dried up. 
uh, and it's the forest that can start coming back uh, if we start regenerating gr groundwater. Um, so I'm encouraging people, even in the Bucabero area where they have significant rainfall, to still consider water catchments, and it seems to be catching on. We've already built six water catchments in Zambia, and um, I think they have they have interest in building another six for the schools that they're starting. But in Matsaka, uh, they had a meeting a couple of days ago and they were requesting 110 water catchments. How much uh, does it cost to make each water catchment? Uh, each water catchment is about six to $700 in materials. But what they really need first is the training on how to use the brick making machine so that they can build, that they can make the bricks. There's a thousand bricks in a 20,000 liter tank. Once they have the technology to make these bricks, in my mind, this is, you know, this is the teaching the person to fish uh, allegory. Um, the, the soil that is used is called marum. You can dig that up on your own hill. Uh, you can find your own sand. I have done these things while in Africa. I know it's it's very easy and very possible. Even if you have to chop the marum in, it's, it's, you're still, uh, as far as cost goes, you're, it, it, it's so affordable. Um, and the reason we focus on the schools and the clinics is because they're most likely to have the steel roofs that are necessary to uh, capture the uh, water. But I think between soap making and uh, getting folks brick making technology, um, Bedford Rotary could, strike a serious partnership okay. both with University Rotary and Friendly Water for the World. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, 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 Judy, Go ahead. I just want 